This is the Gaumont British News, presenting the world to the world. get cooperation everywhere in making this ministry into what you call a real news distributing body. In the last issue of Go On British News, we told in pictures the full story of the Atlantic meeting of Winston Churchill and Franklin Delano Roosevelt. We sailed in the battleship Prince of Wales. Our news camera covered the ship with the chiefs of our fighting forces. They had a rendezvous with destiny. We have seen the pictorial record of this mid-ocean conference that resolved itself into an eight-point declaration of faith. Some of our scenes were grand. Some were flecked in light and shade with a delicate brush of humor and humanity. The president met Prime Minister, and the declaration of faith which they gave to the world was no grandiose scheme of conquest. It was the simple aim of sane men in a world gone mad to bring back sanity and decency. How different from those meetings at the Brenner Pass when Hitler gave his orders to the gas bag gladiator. Though we guessed that Churchill and Roosevelt discussed the ways and means of victory, those eight points of a decent standard of living are all we need to know. So now, as the Premier waves an answer to the cheers from America's ships, our camera brings you the story of the journey home. Do you remember how Hitler boasted in the spring of 1941 how he would unloose upon our shipping the most terrible storm of destruction? Legions of U-boats would roam the seas so that no ship sailing beneath the Allied flags would reach port. Take pride in your Royal Navy and Air Force. In August 1941, the Prime Minister and his advisers could still make this voyage without incident. Now look ahead one grey morning as they looked on board the Prince of Wales. Stretching across eight miles of sea is a mighty convoy. Great ships, small ships. Cargo boats laden with food and planes and guns and tanks and shells and bullets are coming in to our fortress island. Tankers brimming with oil for bombers. Lamps bowed down to the pencil line with pig iron, steel and ore. Timber and grain. Nickel, manganese, mercury. Terrible toll of men and ships the U-boats and Junkers have taken. But while there's a single crew in the empire, there'll be empire ships on the sea. Churchill gives the word. And the great cavalcade of men of war swings into the ocean caravan. The battleship's halyards are hoisting a signal. Churchill wishes you good luck and bon voyage. And the ships reply with a V in Morse. Another day, and the Prince of Wales is making a landfall. Rising out of the water ahead is a bleak and rugged coast, Iceland, home of a friendly nation whose weakness would have made her fair game in the Nazi hunt for world dominion. But Britain stepped in first. Empire troops have been stationed in this Arctic outpost of civilization. They're making Iceland a fortress too. We've read that recently Roosevelt sent Americans to share with us the job of keeping Iceland safe from German invasion. On land, we shall see those Americans here, on guard. In Reykjavik, Mr. Churchill met the service chiefs in charge and inspected sailors and soldiers and airmen. Premier spoke to the Icelanders from the balcony of the Regency. He was greeted with smiles and cheers which acclaimed him as the champion of liberty for all men. Outside the Regency, he inspected American Marines and afterwards chatted with the men and women who had made our troops so welcome. 
On his journey back to Britain, Mr. Churchill was accompanied by Ensign Roosevelt, the President's son, who stood with him at the saluting pace for the march past. First, the Marines. Australian Air Force. The visit to Iceland was over. Leaving on the last leg of his journey of thousands of miles, our Prime Minister said goodbye. And goodbye to Iceland's Premier, Herm von Jonasson. So back to the ship which had been his home during these tremendous days. no incidents on the voyage. The Nazi bombers kept clear. But just to keep their hand in, the Navy's ACAC gunners had target practice. So dawned the day when they were safe in port again, somewhere in Britain. And the Premier spoke to the ship's company on the deck of the Prince of Wales. Now on your first cruise, you met uh, the Bismarck. And uh, on your second, you met the illustrious President of the United States, who is one of the men who take, will take the greatest part in shaping the immediate future of our civilization. I think you will feel that uh, you have taken part in these important events and uh, that may be uh, an interest to you when the full story can be made known and when the full story of this hard, stern war is told. Churchill travelled overnight from the north, and on the platform at King's Cross, Mrs. Churchill was waiting with America's ambassador, John G. Wynan. And this was the welcome they gave him in London. Within a few hours of his return, the Premier called a cabinet meeting. Ministers attended to hear the secret report of that historic meeting with the President. Later, Mr. Churchill went to Buckingham Palace to deliver to the King a letter from Mr. Roosevelt. And so it ended. Back to routine again. Back with renewed vigor to the job of being the busiest man in the world. And we can draw breath from the rush of travel to pause and consider what it has all meant. It's really quite simple. 
America believes that no man has the right to make a slave of any human being. We believe that too, and we're fighting for our belief. To all enslaved nations, and to ourselves who live today in the shadow of death, we pledge ourselves. No peace without victory. And this time, with God's help, really peace. Thank you.